We need to put skin in the game to do things, but we also need time and we need behavior change. So when we want to change those habits, this is where I'm heading, we're changing the habits. When we want to change those habits of our clients, we need to have set up our systems to do so. So in the academy, we've got programs and practice day coming up. And of course, habit changing is a great way to look at a program. So the way I use programs and the way I've succeeded with programs in my practice is I sell them in practice like they're a supplement. Hello and welcome. Mentoring with Geraldine is a bite-sized practitioner podcast for naturopaths, nutritionists, herbalists, and practitioners. This podcast responds directly to your needs, the needs of the practicing natural therapist. With interviews, herbal discussions, something business, and something clinical each week, you'll get the variety you need and enjoy to stay motivated in practice. Hello, everybody. How are we? Today is habits because habits really are a major part of our clients change. All right. We are change makers. That's what naturopaths and nutritionists and herbalists and coaches are. We're change makers. It doesn't matter how many tablets, powders, whatever you throw at someone, bark flowers, bush flowers, whatever it is, you can throw all that stuff at somebody, but if they don't change their behaviors, then you're not going to get that change that you want in your client. So we've got a lot of language around how we get people to do things, how we ask them and encourage them to do things, how we get them to come back. That's really, really important. We've got to make sure that they're on board. So getting people on board means that they have skin in the game. So sometimes what you'll notice, so for hypnosis, for example, you can see me for hypnosis and, well, you can't actually because there's no, I'm going away, (laughs) close my books for a bit. But were you able to actually manage to get around all of my barriers to you booking in? If you were to book in for hypnosis, then I think it's, 200 or 300, it's not very much. It's a couple of hundred dollars to see me for a hypnosis session, which goes on for more than an hour. I like to see you for three sessions. Is that 400 for three sessions? It's really cheap, right? But that's not a lot of skin in the game. So generally you will see coaches and hypnotherapists charging a lot of money. And you're like, hang on a minute. I'm not charging like that. They must be earning buckets. They're not necessarily earning any more because remember you're getting profit off product, which they're not getting. They are getting that hourly rate. So a counselor is receiving that hourly rate minus fees, charges, rental, all of the other things. So often you will see when you look somebody up, if they're doing a naturopathic appointment, it's actually cheaper than say a hypnosis appointment. Now, I had a client come to see me and she was struggling with cigarettes. She said, oh, she wants to do anything about it. She wants to do anything about it. I was like, we can do hypnosis. And she's like, no, no, no. I want to work on my food and my sugar cravings with you. Okay. So we did the naturopathic stuff and then it was about change behavior. So we have to change the behavior. So I got her to change her behavior. And she was totally in denial about her smoking. I only have one cigarette. I'm not addicted. But then, so the sugar thing was coming along really well. And I think I might've gone away. I think I went to Europe for six weeks in 2019 for a wedding and all sorts of things. And I don't think I could see her. I was away. And of course, my replacement, she's a naturopath. She's not a hypnotherapist. And the other hypnotherapist that I wouldn't want, it's not her jam. So we swap clients. She does a lot of anxiety and all sorts of heavy depression and stuff, whereas I don't do that. I do the habit changing stuff. And um, so this person couldn't see me and she decided at, while I was away that she wanted to give up smoking. Um, so she paid a hypnotherapist not far from me. She could have waited one month or even three weeks, I think it might have been, but she paid him $1,500 for his smoking cessation one-off and recordings. So She paid him $1,500. So that put skin in the game, right? And it really did put skin in the game. So it did work for her for a couple of months because she had that skin in the game. What he hadn't done, however, was following her up. There was no aftercare, right? And what we're doing, we have to remember, there has to be pre-care and aftercare. There has to be that first appointment. There have to be follow-up appointments. So my hypnosis, you have to have three appointments. You pay me for three appointments and then we book your three appointments because I have to check we can actually do it. Not everybody can be hypnotized. 
the more intelligent you are, the easier it is for hypnosis to work. So if, if your child happens to have a 99 ATAR, do tell them not to go to a hypnosis entertainment evening because they're probably going to end up on stage clucking like a chicken. But we need to put skin in the game to do things, but we also need time and we need behavior change. So when we want to change those habits, this is where I'm heading, we're changing the habits. When we want to change those habits of our clients, we need to have set up our systems to do so. So in the academy, we've got programs and practice day coming up. And of course, habit changing is a great way to look at a program. So The way I use programs and the way I've succeeded with programs in my practice is I sell them in practice like they're a supplement. Okay, that's the way I've always done it. So it's like it's a supplement and I sell it on the side. So it's going on whilst I'm seeing the client. So I'm seeing the client and they're working through the program. Now you can sell your program anytime, can't you? You can sell it before they come to see you. You can sell the program so that they're in it with you, but I've always sold it like it's a supplement. So mine have been an increase in the price of your appointment, along with this other thing that's the price of a supplement. So it's a bit, we all do them differently. And that just made my mind more affordable. So that's the way I've done it. So when we think about habit change, we have to think about a program. We have to think about how can we change this and support this person over time going forward as the politicians like to say, how do we do this going forward, moving forward? That's right, political line, moving forward. So because with habit change, so the smoking example, it what we get smokers to do before I even do hypnosis is I say to them, with your cigarettes, we need to make it a choice. So all of these things are a choice. With sugar, it's a different hypnosis thing that I do with um, eating cake and foods and things like that. But what we really want is them to be thinking it's hard to have the cigarette. It's uncomfortable to have the cigarette, but I choose to have it because there is no other alternative. I have made this choice because what we don't want with habit change is people feeling I failed. That's it. It's a disaster. I'll just give up now. I'll carry on drinking. I'll carry on smoking. I'll carry on eating the sugar, whatever it might be. What we want them to do is recognize that this is a one-off aberration and they can go back to being the quit person tomorrow, okay? So it's really important that we stress and that they understand that when they go to do the thing they're trying to give up is a choice. They recognize it as a choice. They do the thing as a choice. They drink the coffee, they have the wine, whatever it is, and they say to themselves, this is a choice I'm making because of this reason. I recognize that this thing has happened. I'm not coping with it. A glass of water hasn't cut it. All of these other steps that I'm to take prior to this glass of wine haven't cut it either. So I'm choosing to have this single glass of wine, which I will then go to this other place because I've changed my habit. So I used to sit on the sofa to drink my wine in front of Netflix. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take this glass of wine. I'm going to sit on the veranda for my veranda right here. So point to the veranda. I'm going to sit on the veranda and I'm really going to think about why I've chosen to do this. Perhaps I'm going to journal while I drink it. I am going to do something different. That is habit change, is changing things. And what we do as change makers is we have to give them that alternative right at the beginning, right? They have to understand where that alternative is. So it's not a case of well, I'm going to give up coffee and instead I'm going to drink hot chocolate because you're not really going to notice a big change, are you? Because of the cacao and things like that, you'll probably put on weight because you're having milk that you weren't having before. It might upset your tummy. So we've got to think, what are these swaps? What are these alternatives? And have them ready to go in this change situation, okay? So when we're changing and recreating for them, how is it? that we're changing? What is it that we're doing? And that's part of creating a program for our clients is understanding how do I change it? What is the swap? What is the alternative? And if they fall off the wagon for the one night, it is only for the one night. It is only that one glass of wine on the veranda. It is only that one cigarette down the back of the garden. So with cigarettes, it's hard to do it, right? It's hard to get to the cigarettes. So with cigarettes, They're in a Ziploc plastic bag with an elastic band around them. The matches are in their own Ziploc plastic bag with an elastic band around it. Then there's an elastic band around the whole lot. Then it's in some sort of plastic container. You know, you've got old 
Tupperware style container. And then it's in the kitchen, preferably up high and not far from the sink. Okay, because on the top of that plastic container in big letters is drink water, drink a glass of water before opening. All right. And I try to get people to put this container behind something that they have to move. So it might be behind the spice rack or something. So they've got to move things. There's a lot of activity involved in getting to those cigarettes. So we've got, because we're a change maker, we've got have the glass of water on top. We've got these suggestions so that when they finally get in there, they're making the choice to have a cigarette. They're making the choice to have a glass of wine. Maybe the glass, maybe the wine can be locked in a cabinet, the key at the other end of the house in the Ziploc plastic bag with the elastic band around it in a container saying drink kombucha first, ring your mum, journal, do whatever the other change factors are before they get to it so that they've got that time to think about what they're doing. Because generally you're really stressed, you want the cigarette, you want the drink, you want the coffee, whatever it is, it's a habit. And so We go, we get it, and then we go and sit down in our spot and we do the same thing. We're going drinking with our mates. We're going binge drinking. We go out in the evening. What can be changed in between that? So I went out for dinner with my husband, my son, his girlfriend, and my daughter, and we got it. It was cheaper to get a cocktail jug than it was to get individual cocktails. And I like a cocktail. I'm going to have a cocktail. So we had a cocktail jug and then we had a jug of water. So there was no hangover the next day. I had three cocktails. I had five glasses of water. I was peeing forever. I had to come the night to pee because I had no hangover because I had so much other fluid on board. So if I was, there are some people who really shouldn't drink at all because they can't stop at one and they can't do those things. It's like cigarettes have become so hard and focused and firm in your mind. It has to be a long time between quitting a long, proper long time, like a year before you have another one that you can socially drink and just have a glass or socially or be in a smoky environment and not desperately need to pick up a cigarette yourself. Because the habit part of the physiology has gone, that grappling part that says you've got to have it back, that's making the mind want it. So when we think about changing habits and changing the lives of our clients, we've really got to think of the swaps. We've got to think of the alternatives and we've got to think of the bad things we want them to avoid. How can we avoid them? How can we make it tough, difficult for them to do those things? How can we make it so that when they do it, they say by the time they get in there to that packet of cigarette, they're making that choice. So I used to work for an elderly gentleman and his wife, they smoked all the way through their lives. Children, everybody's, the whole family, they're puffing away. So they had children growing up and they're puffing away in the home is what I mean. The children weren't smoking. Even back in the 50s, the children didn't smoke. It was just the parents puffing away in the house. But she was diagnosed with lung cancer. And as soon as she was diagnosed, the day she was diagnosed, he literally hung up his cigarette packet. So he had Benson and Hedges all around the house. So I was working for him. If you touch these packets, so they're like literally crumbling to dust. But that was his choice. He's like, she's got lung cancer. It's from the cigarettes. I'm not smoking anymore. She's not smoking anymore. And he literally, wherever the cigarette packets, they were just left. So there were some on shelves and some on bookcases. So he had to clean it. She had to clean around them. She had to lift them delicately up, dust them and put them back because they were his. No, I'm not doing this. So with smoking, it is possible to give up cold turkey. It's like coffee. You'll get a headache, but it's not going to kill you. Giving up drugs, there's a major factor in there. And there are medicines that we have to have to you know give up hard drugs but for these other softer things the alcohol you might have to cut down slowly a little bit at first if they're really heavy drinkers because of the dts and all the rest of it coffee we can reduce it down to we've got to one a day and then stop it but we have to think what are the alternatives how are we helping our people how are we helping them through change and what can we do to help them through that change, to be that change maker for them. Because we can't be in their home telling them not, you know, don't do that, don't smoke that, don't touch that. How can we help them and support them? So, I mean, that's what I like about, for example, the HEF 500. I don't use it for everyone, all right? I certainly don't use it for everyone. I use it for quite a few people. And what's good about it, any test that you choose, if it's got an alternatives, Okay, so obviously there's no pain, so I don't have to I don't have to worry about needle stick injury, people any phobias or anything. It's just a little bit of hair. 
But what it's got in it is all the alternatives. So you can get, so when you do, maybe you're doing IgG testing or you're doing blood testing with foods, make sure there are the options for other foods that the person can eat so that they're not just left with a list of no's. What we need is a list of yes. So when we say, I don't want you to have gluten anymore, I mean, that's huge. Don't have bread anymore. We have to describe what it is that we need the client to do instead. So what I always say with a sandwich, you've got a sandwich and the sandwich is bread. So I hold my hands up sort of like that, like as if you're holding a sandwich. I say the sandwich is bread and in that is the tiniest bit of salad. So if you took the bread away, there's no food there and you're hungry, right? Easy. If you made a wrap, you'd fill that wrap with food. A wrap is always filled with food. It's filled with lettuce and carrot and red pepper and your ham or whatever it might be that you've put in there. But you've actually got a very thin piece of paper around it, really, and it's full of food. So then we can go from a sandwich to a wrap, from a wrap to a salad with protein without any wrap around it and meanwhile of course there's the suggestion of all the wraps that don't have gluten if you want them off the gluten so it's helping and demonstrating that there are swaps that are okay for them that they can do that are logical next steps all right so it's really important when we think in our clinic so I'm all about being in the clinic the academy is all about coaching the client and being in clinic with your client um, and how to get them into, into clinic with you. But we have to have these alternatives for them. We have to think, how can we change? How can we support them through change when we're not with them in their home? When lots of the things that people do have a lot to do with hand touching of the lips. So if you're smoking a cigarette, you're touching your lips. If you're drinking a glass of wine, it's something that goes and is contact with the mouth and the lips. You're kissing someone contact with the mouth and the lips. So there's a lot of gratification when we touch our lips. So when we go to change something, when we're encouraging the change from one food to another or from one behavior to another, we have to think, what does that behavior involve? So yes, with sugar, we've got all of the biochemistry going on. Absolutely. But we've also got a physical action going on. We've got a past. So I bought a lottery ticket today. So if I win, I won't be back next week. But that might just be a one-off there. Anyway, I was there and the women at the counter were talking about donuts. And one said, I love donuts. And I said, I hate donuts. I think they're disgusting. She was like, what? I said, well, actually, I'd rather have a lamington because a lamington means something to me. If I had, I grew up in New Zealand and, you know, white bread, curried egg sandwich, be delicious, followed by a lamington. So if I don't eat sweet foods, I don't eat cake. But if I were offered a cake in a shop and I thought I'm starving, I've got to really want to eat something or I really feel like cake, I would pick the lamington over the donut in every single time because the donut we know is super bad for us, probably worse for you than the lamington. At least the lamington's got coconut on the outside, right? But that has no significance. And the donut has no emotional significance to me. I did not grow up on donuts. So if there were the two objects there, donuts, 50 cents, lamingtons, $2. I have to eat something because I'm on a desert island and it's the only choice I've got. I will pay the $2 for the lamington because there is an emotional significance there for me. All right. So when we're talking to our clients, we have to think, well, okay, so she's a lamington eater. What can I give her that would be a replacement for sweet cake? Now, I could give her a protein ball. I could, I mean, we could get this person to go cold turkey and not have sugar. We could get them to start filling up on lunch and dinner on salad. If we're going to say we don't want you to have something at all ever, then are they allowed a night off from that? So it might be, for example, I had a child a long time ago now, a child come to see me with juvenile arthritis. So obviously I wanted the child off sugar. I wanted them off gluten. I wanted them off everything really. And I wanted them on all of the supplements. And so when I looked at it, that's hard. A kid not having anything. So we had to work out recipes that the child, and this was a long time ago. So this was before it was really easy to find all these wonderful recipes. We had to think of alternative recipes and birthdays. Now it's nice and easy to find all sorts of recipes without everything in them, but there wasn't when I started out. 
So we had to think of these alternatives. We had to go out of our way to find alternatives for cake and things like that. And then, but ultimately, what I did say and what I do say to my clients with children is feed them before they go to a birthday party. But unless it's an actual allergy, birthday parties are part of growing up. So let's not deny those children what the party is all about. Let's feed them before they go so that hopefully they're not that hungry when they get there because generally children will only eat as much as they want these days. We don't make them finish their plates like they did when we were growing up. So hopefully what's going to happen is the child will have eaten before they go. They might have one mouthful or something or they might just eat the icing off the top and leave the rest of it because we have to think of the emotional significance of the things that we put in our mouths on top of everything else. And that's part of being that change maker with the client is what is the significance of the food that goes in this and the specificity of it, the donut versus the lamington, for example. I had a lady and she, so I did hypnosis with her. I said to her, you know, do you like salad? And she said, yes, she did. So we did hypnosis. And she was part of a project I was doing, part of my dissertation. And of course, I did a postgraduate diploma in hypnotherapy. I didn't just do a weekend course, like everything else that I do. Got to do it right, yeah? So um, so it was part of my dissertation. So actually, she was part of it and lost. I had to put a rope around her because I couldn't measure her with a tape measure because she was too big. But we lost that much in the rope, right? So we were losing a lot of weight here. But that very first hypnosis session, I was talking about salad while she was under. Now, what I hadn't done, of course, was ask her what types. She didn't like lettuce leaves. So when I used the word salad, she changed it to pumpkin and all of these root vegetables and all sorts of things that she was going, you know, that were roasted that were then turned into the salad. So we had a bit of work to do after that. And it was a, it was a real learning moment for me to realize that there is this difference between food groups, but within a group like cake, it's not just cake. You know, I like carrot cake. But lots of people don't like carrot cake. But actually, I did. It, Tasman, when we were in Tasmania in November, I did actually search out carrot cake. I had some of the best carrot cake I've ever had anywhere in Tasmania. So, and gin, not together though. I didn't have gin and carrot cake together, but I did allow myself carrot cake because I do enjoy it. I particularly like the cream topping um, after I'd been on a hike. So if I'd just done 30 Ks, I was okay to have a bit of carrot cake. I don't think it's habit forming. But we have to think, what are these alternatives? What can we negotiate with our client? What will they go for in the change? And how will we get them to change? How can we get their skin in the game as well so that they're up for it, so they want to do it? What is the end result? What is the goal for them in coming to see you? And are we working towards their goal or our goal. Right, I'm off now. I've run out of voice. I will leave you to it. Have an absolutely brilliant rest of day. See ya. Thanks so much for joining me today. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast for the weekly episodes. If you'd like even more support and learning, then the Academy is for you. Here you'll find part two of the herbal discussions, more clinical learning, and case studies to support your clients in practice. Bye for now.